All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. My name is Dr. Mohammed Gamrawi, and on behalf of the Jaffer Center for Muslim World Studies, we'd like to welcome you all to today's guest lecture, Kashmir and Modi's India, Continuities, Changes, and Challenges. Today, our guest speaker will be Dr. T.J. Lagori, who will be discussing the situation in Kashmir. <clears throat> Dr. Ligori's research interests include international political theory, international historic sociology, Kashmir, South Asia, and post-colonial and decolonial conceptions of the international. Dr. Ligori wrote his uh, dissertation on Kashmir and also did field work in and on the region. He's taught classes on South Asian history and culture, introduction to epistemology, research design, development of international thought, contemporary dynamics of IR, IR theory, and introduction to international relations. Please help me in welcoming our guest lecturer today, Dr. T.J. Ligori. All right, so uh, this discussion is mainly just going to be an overview of Kashmir. It's not going to be um, really novel scholarly take on the matter. I will add some of my own contributions toward the end of the lecture, but it's just going to be an overview of where the region is and what the uh, kind of contours of the dispute are. Um, but as you'll see, the historiography is itself very contentious, and that's at uh, the heart for many different parts of the, uh, the conflict itself. So you'll see the region located here. And uh, kind of the crux, the uh, crossroads of Central Asia and South Asia. And in many ways, I think that it helps to conceptualize Kashmir as a borderland. So I think it's useful to think of a lot of different areas as borderlands. But in doing so, you're able to see the multiple different peoples and uh, practices and lineages and cultures and histories that all uh, combine in different ways across the region. So. Just to give an overview of about 2,000 years in about 30 seconds, um, from the ancient times to the 19th century, I'm going to really focus on the 19th century because that's where a lot of uh, the current, uh, the basis for the current dispute come from. So we have some of the early texts that do mention Kashmir. It's largely absent from some of the Vedic texts, but we do see the beginnings of the mention of Kashmir in texts like the uh, Mulasavarstivada Vinaya, uh, the Nilamata Purana, and the Vishnudamadara Purna, uh, Purna, which are in the kind of later antique, early medieval period. Um, and then we also get this kind of um, recension uh, it coming across in the Raja Tarangini, which itself has a very complicated history. It was written by uh, Kalhana uh, during the reign of Jayasimha, uh, during the uh, Lahar dynasty in about 1148, 1149. But then we have other versions of the Raja Tarangani come up uh, under Janaraja, under Srivara, and under Shuka uh, in the later medieval period. But at each point, what we get is kind of a, re uh, a recap of what we have laid out from these earlier uh, Puranas and uh, the Mulasavastivada Vinaya. Um, and what we have is this basic story that gets kind of told over and over again that originally in Kashmir, it was a lake. Uh, and it was a lake ruled by a giant serpent, a, a giant Naga. And the people there were called Nagas. And then eventually uh, through, in the Mullava Savastivada uh, Vinaya, it's uh, a Buddhist sage, monk. And the other two Puranas, it's actually um, uh, a, sa uh, a Vedic sage, Kashyap, who comes in and basically is in the um, in incarnation of Vishnu, comes through and defeats the giant serpent. The lake dries up and allows it for human habitation. But what that uh, tells us is the story of an indigenous people who were there before the beginnings of the coming of these different forms of um, Brahmanic and Shramanic uh, culture. So in the early period, what we have, and this is all told again in the Raja Tarangani, and again in the later Raja Taranganis as well, uh, we have from about the time of the Mullah Sarvastivada Vinaya 
uh, Buddhist culture there. And by the time we get to the uh, the great Yogacara and sage uh, Vasubandhu of the fourth century, he tells us that it is a very partisan region. This is a very um, Sarvastivadin uh, region. So there's a distinction between the Yogacharans and the Sarvastivadins, and Kashmir is associated primarily with the Sarvastivadin culture. And what we have with the different dynasties that come in at these different times is the patronage of one or another of these sects or these uh, dynasties. And by the time we get to the 6th century, we've already had a beginning of the move toward a, Shaivite, uh, a Shaivism. So pay, uh, rulers who patronize Shaivite understandings of um, Hinduism, beginning primarily with Miharakala of the 6th century, but then we have other um, kind of rulers and uh, takes on Shaivism come forward. But by the time we get to the Nilamata Purna and the Vishnadharmatara Purna, it's a, more of a Vaishnavite understanding of, um, of religion. Before that's eventually um, superseded by a kind of novel philosophic understanding of uh, Shaivism. And there's a lot of different uh, sects and groups that are on, uh, that are around during this medieval period. But uh, this is where we also get some of the great uh, works of uh, Trika, um, which is the Kashmiri Shaivite non-dual philosophy that comes forward. Primarily the, the most notable exponent is Abhinav Gupta in the 10th and 11th centuries. Um, but these are some of the kind of the uh, more decorated figures in the uh, philosophical trends of the movement. Um, and as you'll see, the note of these different dynasties, some of whom ca are coming from South Asia, many of whom are coming from Central Asia, including the Huns. Um, then we have the Utpala dynasties, the Karakuta dynasties, the Har Lahara dynasties, until we have our first uh, Muslim ruler with the uh, Ladakhi, which is a Western Tibetan uh, province, we'll talk about Ladakh, um, ruler Rinchana, who changes his name to Sajradin, and he rules over the, uh, the area for three years. Uh, he marries the former queen, uh, Kotarani, who then takes over uh, after Sajradin's demise and rules for 16 years with a lot of controversy kind of in that period before we have um, the supersession by the Shamiri dynasty, which is a uh, distinctly Muslim dynasty. Now, even though it's uh, Muslim, there's a lot of uh, Hindus, pundits uh, at the court. And this is where Janaraja is going to be writing from in the 15th century, as will Srivara, as will Shuka. They're all getting court patronage uh, during this time. And the Kashmiris look at the Shamiri dynasty as the last period of independent Kashmir before it's taken over by the Mughals, which is a very interesting departure from the nationalist historiographies we get in both India and Pakistan, who both uh, in different ways seek to claim the Mughals for their own, uh, but the Kashmiris by and large don't. They look to the Shamiri dynasty as the last period um, of that uh, independence. And the last 30 years actually is the Chuck dynasty, which is a, a Shia dynasty that uh, emerges from the nobility in the 1550s. But from the Mughal period, uh, we have the Afghan conquests in the 1750s, and then the Sikh conquest in 1819. And that really sets the stage for what becomes uh, the Dogra period, where we have the basis for a lot of the current disputes start to emerge. So it's a picture here of Raja Gulab Singh, um, who later becomes Maharaja Gulab Singh. He's uh, a high-ranking general from Jammu who is in the uh, Sikh Empire. Uh, he's a key person at the court, and there's a lot of internecine conflict uh, in the aftermath of Ranjit, Ranjit Singh's demise in 1839. So the Sikh court is tor uh, torn into a bunch of different factions pulling in different directions from the period of about 1839 to 1845, the six-year period. And Gulab Singh and his two brothers, John Singh and Suchet Singh, are three of the top-ranking figures um, in the Sikh dynasty. Not the top three, but three very prominent figures. And at different times, and uh, actually his nephew as well, Hira Singh, they take different sides uh, during this conflict. And uh, he reaches out to the East India Company at one point in 1843 or 1844, which doesn't really amount to much. But this is also the period where the East India Company is expanding into other parts further uh, west into the uh, subcontinent. So 1843, they take Sindh. 1841 was the Anglo-Afghan War. Um, and they're waging a war against the Sikhs in 1845, or at least looking to, but they need 
crucial allies. So they engineer a defection from Gulab Singh, who wasn't satisfied with the ruling house in the Sikh Empire at, uh, at the time. Anyway, um, so they basically mount a false flag operation to get the Sikhs to cross the agreed upon border so that they can have an excuse to invade the Sikh Empire, all the while uh, engineering this key defection from Gulab Singh, uh, which basically throws the war decisively in the favor of the Brits, which they're able to um, defeat the Sikhs in a few months. And in March, they uh, come to an agreement, which basically leaves Gulab Singh in charge of this entire princely state. It's enormous, um, and it's not anything that necessarily corresponded to anything he had direct control over. Under the Sikh Empire, he was given um, the title of Raja, ruler over the Jammu region, and that's where his family had descended from. And uh, he, with the treaties of Lahore and Amritsar in 1846, he's given Jammu, Kashmir, Ladakh, Gilgit, Baltistan, Khazara, and Chitral. All of these areas are given to um, Gulab Singh under the protection of the princely state. So the princely state system, the way that was set up by the British, was basically to leave uh, the rulers alone within their domains to be able to autonomously enact whatever laws they saw fit while ceding any uh, forms of international commerce contact or trade to the British um, government. So international communications, uh, foreign policy, military, that would all be ceded to the British government. But in return, the British would be the stabilizing bloc behind the stability of the, of the princely states themselves, of the Dogra um, dynasty uh, in this case. And this actually paid dividends for the British 11 years later, when a lot of South Asia in 1857 broke out in uh, revolt against their, um, their rule in the, what's called the Sapahi Revolt or the First Indian War of Independence, uh, Gulab Singh, uh, who had just actually uh, abdicated his throne but was still alive and instructed his son Ron Bear to remain loyal to the British and there was no major um, uprisings against British rule in uh, the Dogar dynasty uh, at this time in the Dogar domains. Um, we get a very different, um, self-consciously different character associated with Ron Beer's reign, and primarily the latter part of his reign. He seeks to basically make himself self-consciously Hindu, and this is a result of a lot of other uh, developments happening throughout South Asia, including the development of pan-South Asian identities across religious lines, whether that be Hindu or Muslim. So there's the development of uh, Dharmart, uh, there's the development of uh, trusts, there's the development of um, uh, uh, these endowments, these big, large-scale endowments, these vox that are given to uh, primarily uh, Hindu organizations uh, during this time. And he also has uh, compiled for himself a court panegyric called the Golabnama by Devan Kripadam. And uh, Kripadam is a pundit who composes this Golabnama, which is basically a panegyric made to uh, make Ranbir Singh and his father Golab. It's like a history of Golab, but in a very flowery light uh, to make him look uh, excellent uh, in terms of his lineage, in terms of his conduct, in terms of his aptitude and all of these other things. But what it does is it fabricates, um, which draws for some basic truths, but it fabricates a very illustrious dynasty and a very self-consciously, not only Hindu, but Rajput orientation to uh, the Dogra dynasty itself. So this is uh, deliberate policies that uh, Rambir Singh has undertaken, primarily in the latter part of his, lane, uh, in his, of his reign, from the 1770s into uh, 1780s, uh, before he dies in 17, and, uh, sorry, 1870s to 1880s, before he dies in 1885. Uh, this is also the period of a major geopolitical dispute uh, between the British and the Russians in Central Asia. And because these Dogra domains also include these far northern reaches that you'll see on the map, what's uh, labeled the northern areas, Gilgit and Baltistan, um, during the Russian progression, the northern reaches of the Gilgit area are, is less than 30 miles from the border of the southern reaches of the um, Russian Empire. So there's a lot of anxiety on the part of the British policymakers, and especially on the British policymakers who were based in India. And it's almost paranoia that they overblow the threat that could be 
uh, actually there. But it's uh, met by the southern incursion of Russian troops into Uzbekistan, Chimkent, Khiva, Samarkand, Bukhara. All of these areas gradually fall under Russian domains in the 1860s and 1870s. So there's frantic uh, writing on behalf of a lot of officers who are located in the uh, northern part of these areas. So the Brits start sending to um, Ron Beer Singh a number of officers. Officers on special duty was what their title was. They would later be transformed into residents uh, at the end of the 1880s. So there's a lot more um, notice that's being put. And but it's made clear to Ron Beard that we're not going to interfere with your internal administration. We're only going to deal with the Russians who are coming down from uh, the north. So um, this became, uh, again, the central focus for the Brits during this time. And in 1889, four years into Pratap Singh's reign, uh, during a period of, again, increased anxiety, the great game lasts till 1904, uh, the Brits actually overthrow um, Pratap Singh and put a caretaker government in place for 16 years. So they put a number of residents there to basically monitor the situation. And the reports that are coming out from the, uh, the settlement officers, the settlement commissioners, including Andrew Wingate, but most notably Walter Lawrence, uh, who would later be the secretary to the viceroy in Calcutta, uh, George Nathaniel Curzon, uh, are on the appalling state of development within Kashmir, primarily in the Muslim population. So uh, the first uh, statistics that we end up getting about uh, literacy rates show a marked contrast between the Muslim uh, population, which is at this time in the 1890s, over 90% of the population. In the valley, it's probably about 92 to 93% uh, from the first statistics that we have in the Hindu population in the valley. The Kashmiri Hindus uh, are usually identified with the Kashmiri pundits. Uh, about 5 to 6% of the population in the 1890s. The Hindu population has a literacy rate approaching 50%, so about 45, 46, 47%. The pundits, even during the time of Mughal rule and, um, and uh, the Shamiri dynasties, had uh, always been kind of a literate class who were patronized for their literacy and their ability to f uh, be court functionaries. Uh, the Muslim literacy rate in the 1890s is 1.5%. Uh, so there's a marked contrast in not only literacy, there's development, and also governmental posts, which were given discriminately uh, to Hindus, and uh, not even Kashmiri pundits, primarily uh, Dogris and people from outside of the state who were given the highest ranking positions in the Dogra government. So it was actually because of a lot of uh, activity of Kashmiri pundits to get more seats in the government reserved for Kashmiris that we had the State Subjects Act passed in 1927, uh, which has recently been labeled something very controversial, but it was in order to make sure that it was Kashmiris who were owning property within the state and not uh, a number of South Asians coming in from, uh, from elsewhere. Um, so the British uh, caretaker government is there for 16 years. There's a number of land settlement reforms which are enacted, which do something to rectify, but only something very um, minor, to rectify the gross imbalances of power uh, that exist at the time. Um, and then we have, again, just kind of move forward, the, the next um, monarch was Hari Singh, uh, who was in power from 1925 up until the independence of India and Pakistan in 1947. And there's a number of things that happened during this time. One is uh, his appointed prime minister, who was um, not from Kashmir, he was from uh, elsewhere in South Asia, Albion Banerjee, um, wrote an expose upon his retirement, uh, his resignation from the office of uh, prime minister in 1929, basically talking about the fact that he had suggested all of these reforms to take place in order to uh, develop uh, the region and Kashmir and create better standards for literacy and more educational institutions and things like that. And these um, recommendations all went completely ignored. Uh, so they weren't implemented. And uh, there was actually a number of different things which were the cause for the 1931 uh, revolt which took place on July 13th uh, of that year. And we have a kind of figure about whom not much is known. Um, most accounts say that he came in uh, from, he was Pashtun, he came in from the Pashtun areas, or other accounts had that, uh, yes, he was, but he was a servant of, um, of, a, of a British um, 
uh, officer position there. But uh, Abdul Qadir uh, made a, a speech at a gathering uh, basically against the Dogra monarchy and against uh, the discriminate employment opportunities that were, uh, that were available, which led to the first kind of wide uprising in 1931. And this was a much more um, popular democratic movement that uh, we saw taking place. And it was met with a brutal crackdown by the Dogra government. Um, and about 22 people were killed uh, in the uprising uh, and the riots that took place, uh, all uh, demonstrators. So uh, that revolt led to the British to be put on notice about some of the developments within Kashmir. Again, the British largely stayed hands off from the princely states themselves, uh, with the exception of a number of recommendations that were given. So they sent uh, Bertrand Glancy uh, into Kashmir in 1932 to investigate the matter. And they actually had sent a commissioner there 15 years prior uh, the, under Sh um, Commissioner Sharp. Uh, and he also gave a number of recommendations which were completely ignored by the Dogra government, uh, Pratap Singh at the time. Uh, Glancy uh, basically says that a lot of the things that we've been saying for the past 30 years had went completely uh, unreformed and that there weren't necessary measures uh, put in place that we had recommended for a while. So uh, this was just a much sterner warning to the, uh, the monarchy to implement some basic changes, which some of which was done. Uh, a modicum of these changes were actually implemented, and there were uh, greater allowances for representation, and actually, for the first time, actually representative government uh, within the, uh, the Dogra regime. It also leads to the development of the first uh, kind of agitation coming from the ground level um, at first, they termed themselves the Muslim Conference, but in an appeal to the wider population, they changed their name in the later 1930s to the National Conference. It's the same National Conference that exists today. And it was led by Sheikh Abdullah, who originally uh, organized a number of um, people in what was called the Reading Room uh, Party in, uh, in Srinagar. So, they organized into a conference to press some demands for, to press for uh, uh, representation, to press for greater employment opportunities, to press for more educational institutions uh, and land reforms, and a number of other societal and economic changes uh, to be put in place. Um, and that doesn't really amount to the changes that uh, were felt necessary. This is also happening at the same time that we're getting the broader kind of uh, anti-colonial movement coming from within India and Pakistan, and which would eventually result in those states. So I think it is helpful to think about the movement against the Dogra regime as an anti-colonial movement, being that the Dogras were themselves propped up by the British, uh, as well as uh, an anti-monarchical uh, movement. So. Um, in 1939, actually, one uh, prominent segment of the National Conference breaks off, and they go, they revert to the older name and call themselves the Muslim Conference. There's uh, a few other parties, a few other organizations which are around, and their power bases are in different areas. The Muslim Conference would later have its power base in the uh, western areas of Jammu, which had a primarily uh, Muslim population, uh, although they're power was certainly uh, felt and acknowledged in uh, in the valley itself, in Kashmir Valley itself. The National Conference main power center was in uh, the Kashmir Valley. Um, a number of documents end up emerging from this uh, movement, including Naya Kashmir, also known as uh, New Kashmir, which was put forward uh, pressing for women's rights, pressing for equal employment opportunities, uh, for more equitable economic um, uh, uh, distribution of resources and uh, a number of other things. This is backed by the National Conference and um, this was what later uh, UN Census, uh, sorry, uh, United Nations Commissioner on India and Pakistan, uh, Yosef Korbel, would call a communist document and they would see it as something which was uh, antithetical to the United States' interests in the later 1940s and early 1950s. Um, 
Sheikh Abdullah is uh, also going to spearhead the Quit Kashmir movement, which is, again, an outgrowth of the Quit India movement, which is the broader movement organized by the Indian National Congress against the British uh, throughout the 1940s. There's a number of cross-cutting alliances which also take place within Kashmir. The National Conference ends up establishing an alliance with the Indian National Congress. Uh, the Muslim Cong Prince ends up establishing something of an alliance with the Muslim League, although this is not to say that one is entirely subsumed by the aims of the other. The National Conference still has its National Conference aim. The Muslim Conference still has its Muslim Conference aims. What often gets left out uh, in our stories about 1947 is the Punch Rebellion and Massacre uh, of that year, which was actually the basis for um, what becomes the stalemate between Hari Singh, uh, Maharaja Hari Singh, and the Indian and Pakistani governments uh, after independence. So I'll get to that. But questions of uh, 1947. Um, as the British were coming to this acknowledgement that we're going to have an independent India and we're going to have an independent uh, Pakistan, after that acknowledgement is uh, made, and the lines that are drawn are not very clear at, uh, on August 14th and August 15th. In fact, it would take anybody living on the western border of India, that border which now abuts uh, Pakistan, or what was then West Pakistan, uh, people wouldn't know where they were situated for three days until after this uh, independence was declared. And crucially, um, there wasn't a clear method by which districts and tassels were, divi uh, were divided. So the one major entry point into Kashmir, uh, Gurdaspur, had a 51% Muslim population and a 49% Hindu population. Punjab was rife with these issues where a lot of times neither a Muslim or Hindu uh, constituency had 50% uh, because of the large uh, Sikh constituency there as well. Uh, Gurdaspur was given to um, India in the award, in the Radcliffe uh, Award of uh, 1947, which also provided this entry point uh, into uh, Jammu. There were the, also the issues of the princely states. There were three major princely states that there wasn't uh, an established procedure for deciding where exactly they would end up at independence. You had the British Raj, which was about 60 to 70 percent of what was South Asia in terms of population and area. And then you had the princely Raj, which were all these princely states, 565 in total, that were dotted throughout the subcontinent. And there was no clearly established pattern for recognition of where each would go. And you had three very contentious issues. You had uh, Jammu and Kashmir, which had a Hindu ruler and a predominantly Muslim population. You had uh, Junagadh, which was located in Gujarat uh, in the Kathiawar uh, Peninsula, which had a Muslim ruler and a predominantly Hindu population. And you also had Hyderabad, ruled by the Nizam, a uh, Muslim ruler with a predominantly Hindu population. So there were debates about where each would end up. You also had a couple of other contentious cases um, as well. There was a commissioner going around to establish where each princely state would fall. Uh, he was working under the um, direction of uh, Vallabhai Patel. Uh, his name is VP Menon, and VP Menon goes to the Maharaja of uh, Jodhpur who didn't really want to accede to either domain. The princes would probably have preferred Pakistan because of some of the allowances for decentralization given by the government in Pakistan, or the 2B government in Pakistan, and the more centralizing impulses of the uh, Indian National Congress. So the Maharaj of Jodhpur was basically undecided until he was being pressed by VP Menon and pulled a gun and nearly killed Menon on the spot of the negotiations. Um, what ended up happening in Junagadh was uh, an, in an invasion of uh, Indian forces, which basically compelled uh, Junagadh's accession into India. And Junagadh didn't uh, border the new state of Pakistan anyway. Anywhere, it would have been completely uh, an exclave or um, um, completely surrounded by India. The debate around Jammu Kashmir or Hyderabad is also hugely contentious in 1947 and 1948. So two months goes by and Hari Singh still hasn't made up his mind. There's a number of agreements which are reached between Pakistan and India, but I don't want to dwell on that for the moment. I do want to acknowledge them, though, because I think that when we do this, and I, this is a model United Nations class, when we look at this as only a problem between states, we often lose third and fourth and other parties which might be uh, 
uh, part of these uh, conflicts as well. So um, Hari Singh hadn't made up his mind for about two months. October comes around, um, and he's still debating what to do. He signed standstill agreements uh, with Pakistan. India did not sign a standstill agreement. The Pakistani understanding of the standstill agreement was that Hari Singh would not reach out to India. Hari Singh probably didn't feel compelled one way or the other uh, by, by the document. And there's also debate in India about what to do with Jammu and Kashmir. Uh, Patel, who, uh, Vallabhai Patel, the first Indian Home Secretary, uh, actually wanted to concentrate resources on confirming the accession of Hyderabad rather than Jammu and Kashmir. Nehru actually pulled more in the other direction towards the accession of Jammu and Kashmir. Um, in this intervening period, there's a widespread revolt um, happening in the western Jammu areas and in Punch. And there is uh, a catastrophic clampdown which is put onto the population, an ethnic cleansing which uh, kills well over 100,000 or, or tens of thousand people. Estimates have it over 100,000. Uh, but tens of thousand people killed in uh, um, western uh, Jammu and Punch. And um, as a result of which calls uh, for jihad reach uh, some areas in the newly created Pakistan over on the, uh, what was then called the Northwest Frontier Provinces, the, the Pashtun areas. So a number of irregular forces cross the border and uh, intervene in, this is October of 1947. As the revolt gets out of hand and uh, Hari Singh doesn't think that he has the resources to be able to effectively crush it, he reaches out to India. There's debates about when the instrument of accession is signed. I don't think that that is, again, all of that important. It was pretty clear that his, uh, um, his motives were to join uh, India. So he reaches out to uh, the Indian government and Nehru sends forces and then Pakistan sends their own forces and we have the first Indo-Pakistani war triggered over the issue of Kashmir on this uh, very issue. And this is October 26, 1947. So um, Nehru actually reaches out to uh, the United Nations. It's India that reaches out to the United Nations in order to come to a resolution the United Nations passes a number of resolutions throughout 1948, uh, basically saying we need a ceasefire, we need a ceasefire, then we could figure out what's going on. And the ceasefire is eventually established on the 5th of January, 1949. What the ceasefire basically says was that uh, both India and Pakistan need to take their forces out of Kashmir and there needs to be a situation of law and order present, and then we can uh, have a plebiscite, or there, then we can uh, understand the wishes of the people. So those conditions have to be met first, and neither side was really willing to budge first, and there was a lot of finger pointing going on about who was not pulling out of uh, each area. The ceasefire line actually cut through the princely state. Um, and this also speaks to the differences that happened within the state itself. So as already mentioned, um, the western part of Jammu, the Punch region, were a stronghold of the Muslim Conference, which had their alliances with the Muslim League uh, that ended up establishing um, Pakistan. Um, there was also kind of an independent uh, movement in the northern areas dating back to June of 1947 in Gilgit, where a number of, um, you know, the Gilgit Scouts, which was the military group located in Gilgit, had reached out to Pakistan uh, earlier um, than this. So the line that ends up getting drawn is more or less with some very minor changes and one major change in uh, the area of Tibet and Xinjiang on the Chinese side. Uh, the same contours that we have uh, today. So these lines are drawn. Kashmir is um, divided. Most of Kashmir ends up in the Indian administered portion, although you just get Muzaffarabad and the Neelam Valley uh, in the Pakistani uh, portions. So the United Nations then heads a commission to basically figure out a solution to this. It's uh, remarkably unsuccessful. Uh, Joseph Corbell heads this and uh, is sent there uh, before he's recalled because there's um, a revolution in Czechoslovakia and he's no longer the legitimate Czechoslovak representative as the communist government takes over in 1948. Um, and the UN Commission on India and Pakistan ultimately ends without a resolution. So then the UN passes another Security Council resolution establishing the United Nations Military Observer Group in India and Pakistan, or UNMOGIP, and here they employ a number of other officials to go in and ascertain a possible solution to the issue. Uh, this includes uh, Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz, 
This includes uh, General uh, Canadian General McNaughton, and this includes an Australian jurist, uh, Owen Dixon. Owen Dixon comes up with a plan for a plebiscite region by region, but again, appended to the idea that there has to be an established law and order situation present before we're able to ascertain what's going on uh, in any particular area and the wishes of any particular group. So this is already 1950. India has already passed a constitution in uh, January 26th of that year, and uh, within that, they are creating um, a couple of articles for the accession of Jammu and Kashmir under a special consideration. So this later gets uh, put into the constitution later in the 1950s uh, under Article 370. And in Article 370, it's basically a situation of asymmetric federalism. So you have a special degree of autonomy within your state, a little bit more autonomy than any other state, but you're still a part of India. So um, that's included into the, uh, the Indian constitution. For uh, those of you wondering about the role of the United Nations, with the advent of Cold War politics and the veto within the uh, United Nations Security Council, there are no more resolutions passed, with some exceptions in 1957, because the USSR gets mad at India for saying something about the invasion of Hungary um, just before that. But there are no other major resolutions passed for uh, after 1957 about this issue. It de facto um, uh, resolves into a bilateral dispute. When I say this, again, this is taking out the voice of any Kashmiri who's present there. So this becomes kind of an India versus Pakistan thing um, on, the, um, on the bilateral stage rather than the inclusion of any uh, third voices. So what's going on uh, within Kashmir itself? Sheikh Abdullah is more or less just given the mantle of the prime ministership, which is confirmed after an election, uh, which was probably incredibly rigged. Uh, he wins nearly 100% of the seats in the Legislative Assembly. Um, this is going to be a condition which repeats itself uh, a number of different times throughout Kashmir, but is able to pass one major piece of legislation which had uh, momentous um, effects on the societal makeup of Kashmir, which was the big um, Landed Estates Abolition Act of, 18, uh, of 1950, which limits the amount of land uh, that individuals are able to uh, hold and is a part of the broader policy of land to the tiller campaign. But again, wasn't nearly as revolutionary as is often claimed, but nevertheless did have some uh, pretty big effects. Uh, as we move again through this period, it's approaching almost one-party rule under Sheikh Abdullah's national conference. But as there seems to be popular agitation uh, and there seems to be an increasing uh, um, attempt by the state of India to exert control over Kashmir, Sheikh Abdullah starts bringing up the idea of a plebiscite. Well, what if we had a plebiscite to confirm what our wishes were in Kashmir? Um, this meets with a lot of opposition, both on a civil society level and on an official state level from within uh, India. Early incarnations of the Hindu nationalists didn't really gain ground, especially after the 1950s, but uh, after the assassination of um, Mohandas Gandhi in 1948 by an RSS uh, cadre, uh, Nataram Godse. Um, there's another Hindu nationalist outfit in 1953, the Parajaparishad, led by Shama Prashad Mukherjee, uh, and he mounts kind of um, a march into Kashmir. He leads a march into Kashmir under the um, kind of slogan, one flag, one banner, one nation um, for Kashmir and for India. Basically, erode the special status that's been given to Kashmir, make for a full inclusion of Kashmir into um, India. Uh, he was arrested uh, and held under house arrest while he was in Kashmir. Uh, he died in uh, uh, June of 1953. And two months later, we have the center, that is New Delhi, dismissing Sheikh Abdullah from power and establishing um, basically um, their own rule uh, in the person of Bakshi Gula Muhammad, who was another national conference uh, member. So it was an engineered defection, uh, but to displace uh, Sheikh Abdullah's rule in, um, in Kashmir in 1953. So Bakshi Gula Muhammad is the next prime minister um, in Kashmir. And during his time, we get the emergence of a plebiscite front, and we get the emergence of uh, numerous other calls 
for a plebiscite to be held in Kashmir. Um, and there also is a gradual erosion of some small symbols of uh, independence or sovereignty that uh, Kashmir had, such as the uh, nomenclature of the elected offices, which at the time were president and prime minister. They get eroded to governor and chief minister in line with all the other states of uh, India at the time. Um, 1963, um, Actually, before I get to that, there's also the Sino-Indian War, which should be brought up, uh, over debated lines that were drawn by the British during the colonial period, and what exactly belonged to China and what exactly belonged to India. Um, that occurred in 1962, which led to the accession, uh, the annexation of Aksai Chin into uh, the Hotan Prefecture of Xinjiang in uh, China. Um, in December, the last week of December 1963, uh, holy relic, a uh, uh, hair supposedly from the beard of the Prophet Muhammad, goes missing in, uh, from Hazrat Ball in Srinagar. And this creates a lot of um, kind of um, upheaval, a lot of turmoil. And I think it can be probably better read as a spark which ignites broader issues of panic that were felt along the population. Uh, before this issue was resolved about two weeks later in 1964. But in this intervening period, we had a number of civil society organizations, such as the Awami Akshay Committee, and a number of other groups uh, become established uh, in Kashmir. Uh, it was on the backs of this turmoil and this dissent that led to uh, the Indo-Pakistani War of 1965, uh, which ultimately uh, led to status quo ante, uh, the lines that were drawn afterwards. Again, this was a Pakistani-Indian war, not necessarily a, a Kashmiri um, war on either side. And the resolution that was reached at Tashkent um, in January of 1966, in the aftermath of this war, basically resolved the issue to a bilateral one between India and Pakistan, again, taking out uh, any kind of Kashmiri voice there. And there's a third war, which did have some skirmishes on the border with Kashmir in 1971, which leads to the Shimla Agreement and basically effectively establishes Kashmir as a bilateral dispute. This isn't taken up by any major third party or international actors uh, during the time. Um, As we move through the 1970s, uh, we get different characters taken by the Indian National Congress. Uh, I could bring, briefly discuss this later, but the Congress under Nehru was more or less this idea of a, uh, if not necessarily in practice, of a multicultural, diverse uh, rainbow coalition, um, to use another person's metaphor of uh, different parties throughout India tied uh, to socialism and to secularism. Those notions of socialism and secularism in different forms gradually get eroded later into the, uh, the Indira uh, Gandhi regime. And during the emergency in 1975, it's where we see um, basically civil, uh, civil law suspended throughout a lot of India and the emergence of you know, opposition groups uh, to Indira Gandhi after the emergency is uh, uh, lifted. In 1975, this also leads to Sheikh Abdullah coming back from prison and working out an agreement with Indira Gandhi to basically be reinstalled or allowed to stand for election again under the National Conference um, as uh, Chief Minister now of Kashmir, uh, which is able to be undertaken. It's probably the freest election that Kashmir had in 1977, but that's not to say it was popular after the fact. Sheikh Abdullah uh, lost a lot of his initial legitimacy that he had in the 1950s with the broader uh, public later in the 1970s as he sought to extend some of the same things that Indira Gandhi was doing during the emergency into Kashmir. Uh, Sheikh Abdullah dies in 1982 and names as the successor to the party his son Farooq Abdullah. Farooq Abdullah is installed in 1982. He has a bit of um, a dispute with Indira Gandhi. Um, along a number of issues. And this is also indicative of a number of trends which start to emerge throughout India in the 1980s, which is a push towards a more neoliberal economy and a less socialist economy, and also um, the engagement of identity politics that, that starts to come in through both the Indian National Congress and opposition to the Indian National Congress, which is established in 1980 as the, the BJP. So um, 
Indira accuses Farouk of being uh, communal. Farouk mounts his responses, and there's also, uh, in 1984, the, um, the Operation Blue Star on Punjab against the, um, uh, the Sikhs and uh, the sack of the Golden Temple at Amritsar. Just before that, Farouk Abdullah is dismissed from power by the governor, who's Jagmohan, who is a functionary um, for a number of different governments in India, but also in charge of slum clearance in the 1970s during the emergency uh, and of uh, forced sterilization campaigns in the, in the urban slums. Um, Jagmohan uh, dismisses Farouk basically at his uh, governor's residence and not at the floor of the parliament, which becomes a major issue, but that's not to say that Farouk was entirely hugely popular, but does show India's policies towards Kashmir. Um, so these are, you know, part of what marks the 1980s before we get to the election of 1987, which is widely regarded as, you know, fabricated, rigged um, candidates who didn't really have any popular support in their constituencies, in their uh, polling areas where they were standing, end up walking away with victories. Uh, and leads to widespread riots, which later take hold in 87, 88, and throughout 89. And what we have up until the present to broadly kind of, uh, you know, gloss over this, this huge history that we have in the last 34 years now is uh, a series of intrusive interventions by the central government uh, against uh, Jammu and Kashmir's agency. Uh, widespread violence uh, that resulted in the uh, the enactment of government's rule in uh, January of 1990, uh, and eventually culminating in the revocation of Article 370 on August 5th, 2019. Uh, in January of 1990, we have the pundit exodus. Uh, there's a lot of debate around this that uh, we could talk about, but this uh, massive exodus of um, Figures have it as over 90% of the pundit population in uh, Kashmir itself, and massive human rights violations uh, upon uh, the public itself, on uh, the Kashmiri public. Uh, figures have differing numbers, but the most commonly accepted numbers, that is from the Jammu Kashmir Coalition for Civil Society, the Association for Persons uh, uh, of parents of disappeared persons, and Human Rights Watch has it at over 70,000. Over 8,000 people disappeared and no idea of where they've, uh, they've been. There's no recognition. That also creates problems for what have been called half-widows, women who aren't entitled to official state support because their uh, husbands uh, aren't officially dead. Um, and also, uh, Matt, the establish the um, findings of mass graves in a number of different locations. Uh, also, this um, huge occupation is the most uh, occupied region in the world. Uh, figures have different numbers, but over 400,000 is usually the established figure. Indian troops, pa paramilitary officers, and a number of other uh, figures present uh, in the region. Um, the What to look forward to is in many ways uh, troubling. Um, since we have had all of these developments, the BJP has been signaling this for uh, a long time in a number of the manifestos uh, that were put out before the elections in 2004, 2009, 2014, and 2019, have been, uh, at various times called for the, uh, the evisceration of Article 370, the full inclusion of all of Kashmir, or depending on the, the version you're getting, or just the administered uh, portion of Kashmir, into Indian territory, official center rule over uh, Kashmir. All of that's been you know, forecasted in documents going back. But even before that, even back to the anti-colonial period, uh, you had calls for Kashmir as part of Greater India, which has always been part of the national imagination of um, of kind of the, the Hindu nationalist uh, understanding of India. But interestingly, it's not necessarily that far out of alignment with the geographical imagination of the Indian National Congress and other parties who have controlled uh, India, all of whom have sought to incorporate in, under different terms Kashmir into their domain. So what I have done up until now was more or less a recap of the general overview, but my own uh, research delves into um, the discourses which are employed for the territorial claims made over Jomo and Kashmir. 
And overwhelmingly, they take the same mechanisms that were established during the colonial period. That is, that Kashmir is fundamentally a Hindu territory. What that very definition is, is in flux in the 1800s and doesn't really come to a crystallization until later into the 19th century and definitely into the 20th century. And is still a subject to some, um, you know, fluidity. Um, so establishing that as, you know, fundamentally Hindu. How is that done in Orientalist texts throughout the 19th century? There's a number of authors who go to study the language. There's a number of um, uh, colonial officials who go to um, understand what Kashmiri is. And one, they only talk to mainly the pundits, primarily because the pundits are the more educated of the community, but also it's because their speech is somehow more pure. Uh, there's a figure which recurs through a number of different colonial officials that if you are listening to someone speak Kashmiri, uh, 20 of their words will be Persian, 10 will be Arabic, five will be Tibetan, and then you'll have some other numbers with some you know, varying uh, limits. So that's one reason why there's the privileging of Kashmiri Hindu speech over Kashmiri Muslim speech. When understanding uh, Kashmiri history as well, it's also conceived of as fundamentally uh, Hindu or Vedic history, uh, which is, again, at odds with just that really brief overview that we did of the period where there was Buddhists and there were Nagas and there were a number of other peoples. And there's very, uh, you know, uh, very diverse, different sects of Hindus uh, who are uh, operating in Kashmir under a series of different practices throughout the medieval period as well. Uh, what the fundamental tenets and traits are. For a lot of British Orientalist authors, going back to the 18-teens and 1820s, and this gets rehearsed over and over again, there's a fundamental, essential Kashmiri characteristics which are usually identified with Hindu characteristics. So interestingly, a lot of those same uh, generalizations, essentializations that are made by British Orientalist authors end up being repeated and replicated in different forms by both the Indian National Congress and um, the Hindu kind of nationalist parties that are um, um, operating as well. And um, it's interesting to see how those um, understandings of plurality ultimately get uh, whittled down, narrowed, um, homogenized and made into a monolithic representation of what an essential identity is so as to cast out all of the messy plurality, all of the messy diversity, all of the um, differing strands which have been present at one or another uh, time. So there's, there's a lot that's uh, there and I know I went way over my time but uh, yeah, I think we're good here.